What's up guys and welcome back to Wall Street Millennial. On this channel, we cover everything related to stocks and investing. In previous videos, we've seen many cases of companies being destroyed or suffering significant reputational and economic damage due to the actions of individual employees. Sometimes, leadership makes business decisions that put companies at inordinate amounts of risk, or employees are incentivized to engage in behaviors that are exactly opposite of the company's interests. For example, in 2008, the Japanese technology and industrial conglomerate Toshiba was hit hard by the Great Recession. As a result of the deteriorating financial environment and pressure to maintain the company's 100-year history of profitability, a corporate environment that encouraged anything necessary to meet quarterly financial expectations set in. Eventually, this led to an embarrassing disaster for the company and top-level management that the company has still not yet fully recovered from. Another example is the case of Jerome Curviel, the French trader for the investment bank Societe Generale. He was described by his lecturers as a mediocre student who was not particularly outstanding. He started his career in finance doing middle office work, but had ambitions to move up the company's ranks and pay grades. In his case, that meant maximizing his own trading profits by taking on inordinate amounts of company risk. In the end, that risk-taking cost the bank more than $5 billion. It might seem like these are just one-off cases where the companies got unlucky with certain employees, but these kinds of situations happen all the time in business. This is the issue of the perverse incentive, a phenomenon that shows up all over politics and economics. A perverse incentive is any incentive structure that leads to undesired and unintended results. The term was first coined by economist Horst Seiber when he described a made-up occurrence in India under British rule. Supposedly, the city of New Delhi had a problem with having too many venomous cobra snakes, and the colonial government wanted to find a way to control their numbers. They came up with a program whereby citizens were paid for each cobra that they killed and brought to the authorities. While this initially worked, eventually people started raising their own cobras to turn in for the cash incentive. The colonial government thus paid out larger rewards than anticipated, without solving the problem of reducing the wild cobra population. That's because the incentive structure produced an optimal way for citizens to act that was not in line with the intended outcome. Although this story is fictional, the same mechanics apply in real life. In the 1970s and 80s, the company Waste Management experienced extreme growth and profitability. Although its business was more like a utility, shareholders came to expect year after year of top and bottom line growth. By the 1990s, the company had begun to saturate its own market and growth slowed. The CEO at the time, Dean Buntrock, felt pressure from shareholders and analysts to find any way necessary to keep their financial results growing. Analysts continually projected quarterly revenue and profit growth, and the investors gave the stock a high price-to-earnings multiple, reflecting their expectations of organic growth. But that level of growth was simply not possible anymore. Garbage disposal is a pretty simple business, with little room for innovation, or any other means of increasing revenue per customer. It's also not a business that is very easy to find areas for cost-cutting. Once waste management had expanded across the country into every major market, growth inevitably slowed. But the way that financial reporting works incentivized waste management not necessarily to do what was best for shareholders and the growth of the company, but instead to meet quarterly expectations for the headline numbers. The company ended up doing that by increasing the amortization period of their garbage trucks by 50% from 8 years to 12 years. This allowed them to record significantly lower amortization expenses and inflate their net earnings. There was no justification for increasing the amortization period, and an internal company study of the useful life of the trucks did not support the increase. But because what Wall Street really cares about is quarterly revenue and earnings before anything else, and total compensation for upper-level management is often tied to financial results and stock prices, this behavior was incentivized. The company was incentivized by the financial markets to report results not necessarily in line with the interests of the company or its shareholders. The perverse incentive issue can also be produced from within a single company. In the early 2000s, Jerome Curviel started working at the French investment bank Societe Generale. Although in his first few years he worked middle office roles doing compliance work, he was eventually promoted to a junior trader position due to his performance. As a trader within the investment bank, his job was to make arbitrage trades on behalf of the bank's own trading accounts. Bonuses paid to traders were linked to the profits generated by their trading. After just a year or two as a trader, his annual bonuses nearly exceeded his base salary. But he knew that other, more senior traders that he worked with were earning bonuses many times even what he was being paid, and he wanted more. That caused him to place huge trades, taking on enormous positions. 
Throughout 2006, he made hundreds of thousands of dollars for the company by shorting certain parts of the market. As his profits grew, so did his confidence. By 2008, he had racked up more than a billion dollars in profits for the bank with his trading. However, that also attracted the attention of the bank's compliance and risk management officers, who he lied to about how much risk he was taking on. In order to reduce his own scrutiny, he deliberately placed some trades that he thought would lose money, specifically by going net long in a market that was just starting to freefall due to the recession. But the magnitude of his losses far exceeded what he expected, and he ended up losing the company more than $5 billion. Because the bank incentivized its traders to generate profits for the company through profit sharing in the form of bonuses, Curviel took on too much risk. To the bank, managing risk is just as important as maximizing return, but managing risk is much harder to incentivize. The SPAC craze of 2020 and 2021 showcases a situation where the way the financial markets work creates a misalignment of the interests of shareholders and the incentives given to SPAC sponsors. A SPAC is, at its core, a way for public market investors to gain access to private investment opportunities. The sponsors of the SPACs often have private equity experience. They raise money through a SPAC from public investors, then they use that money to go into the private markets and buy ownership stakes of private companies on behalf of the SPAC investors. In return for enabling the investment in these private companies, the sponsors receive a portion of the public company after the deal closes. Normally, this stake in the SPAC is held in escrow for some time, so that the sponsor cannot dump the shares right after the deal is closed. This way, the sponsor is incentivized to find good private companies for reasonable valuations, making money for both themselves and the public investors. Unfortunately, the exact structures and arrangements of individual SPACs can vary widely. This creates an enormous amount of confusion and lack of knowledge among shareholders as to the true incentives of the SPAC sponsors. Sometimes, even knowledgeable market professionals can't seem to figure out what the SPAC sponsor's true incentive structures are. Take, for example, this interview with Chamath Palihapitiya, who is a prolific SPAC sponsor, and CNBC's Andrew Ross Sorkin about concerns over the Clover Health SPAC. There is no way that I can win unless the stock goes up. There is risk in all of these things, but the reality is that I'm putting my own money, and what I'm trying to do is put my and reputation no promote, forward and say... And you're getting no pro- But what you just suggested was that you're getting no promote. No, that's not what I'm suggesting. What I'm suggesting is that you have $16 million initially, plus $160 million on the back. Total, total, total. I've just told you what we own. So you're saying now that's going up to about $250 million right now, automatically. Due to the incentive structures of many SPACs, sponsors frequently get what is called the promote. Promote refers to pretty much free shares of the SPAC after the deal closes, which encourages the sponsor to do a good job of seeing the deal through the process. However, it also creates a situation where the sponsors can still be in the green even if the SPAC does poorly in the months following the deal. Reuters reports that studies from Stanford and JP Morgan estimate the average three-month return for SPAC sponsors at something like 400-650%. to That's a huge advantage over regular retail investors and creates the incentive to just do more deals. In the case of Chamath, he put about $178 million of his own money into the Clover SPAC. But based on the free shares he received from the promote, his position automatically goes up to about $250 million, according to CNBC, as soon as the deal closes. That means his effective cost basis is about $7.50 per share. Because of that, Clover could decline up to 25%, he could still be in the green. On the other hand, individual investors who buy in at $10 a share start to have a far inferior risk return profile. To be fair to Chamath, he does put a substantial amount of his own money in, so he's actually one of the better sponsors. For many SPACs, the sponsors can stay in the green even if the shares decline to as low as $3 or even $2. Although many SPACs have made tremendous amounts of money for investors, overall their success is questionable. According to CNBC, historically SPAC stocks have done poorly. Over the past nine years, almost all buy-and-hold investments in SPACs would have lost money over a one- or three-year period. The reasons for this are an ongoing subject of research, whether it be that the valuations of the SPACs are too high, or that there are simply not enough viable, high-quality private companies to support as many SPACs as there are. But with many SPACs, even if the stock price goes down, sometimes by as much as 30% or even more, the SPAC sponsors can still make money on the deal. This has led to sponsors becoming fabulously wealthy. Chamath Palihapitiya, for example, has claimed to be worth somewhere in the range of 10 to 20 billion dollars, although Forbes has him at a little over 1 billion. 
Unfortunately, the incentive to the sponsors of receiving a significant stake in their SPACs after the deals close incentivizes them not necessarily to maximize shareholder return, but sometimes just to do as many deals as possible. In this video, we've seen two kinds of perverse incentives in today's economy. The first kind is when a concrete incentive is set by an authority figure, such as a profit-sharing arrangement with traders working for a financial company. This is the case of Societe Generale, which incentivized Jerome Curviel to take on inordinate amounts of risks to maximize trading profits. The second kind is when the way that the markets or economy is set up inherently incentivizes certain market participants to act not necessarily in the best interests of their stakeholders. This is the case of waste management, which was incentivized by the reality of Wall Street reporting that quarterly and annual profit numbers are sometimes more important than the true business growth. Let us know in the comments section below if you can think of any other cases of perverse incentive that fit one of these two kinds. Also, if you enjoyed this content, make sure to smash that like button and subscribe so you don't miss future videos. In the meantime, thank you so much for watching and we'll see you in the next one. Wall Street Millennial, signing out.